Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. I'm joined with an amazing sister all the way from Ireland today. Her name's Karen. Introduce yourself for us, Karen. Wa alaikum salam, sister. Yes, um, well, I go by Malika now. Um, it's fine. You know, I get called everything, but yes, I'm here in Ireland and um, I'm a revert to Islam, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. And I love the jilbab you're wearing. <laughs> Just like that again. I called it a buyer earlier and she was like, it's a jilbab actually. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm saying that anyway. <laughs> Mashallah, Mashallah. Okay, so you grew up in Ireland, um, which I know a lot about Ireland, a lot about Irish culture. So it's very interesting to hear your story. Were you religious before you became Muslim? Um, yes and no. I guess growing up in Ireland, you know, we were raised in Catholic schools. Uh, we went to church, you know, we were baptized, made our communion, confirmation and all that. We didn't know what we were doing. We just followed suit, you know, you done what you were told. You went to church because you were told to. Um, but in the house itself, we weren't really religious. Um, my grandmother, when we were younger, took us, but it kind of faded out the older we got. So I wasn't really raised in a strict religious household, like at all. Did you kind of like believe in God? Did you find yourself asking God for things like that when you were growing up? Um... Yeah, I kind of always knew there was a God or a higher power. Um, I did pray, obviously, in times of need, as we all did. Um, I spoke to, well, I used to talk to my granddad who had passed over. Like, I'd pray and ask him to protect me because I always believed that he was like my guardian angel and stuff like that. Because we were raised kind of believing that, you know, the spirits were still around us. Um, so I did kind of have some sort of a, you know, belief there, but I just didn't have a foundation behind it, if that makes sense. It's so interesting because I remember as well when I was a kid, um, my older brother passed away when I was around eight years old and I did a very similar thing to you. I used to pray to him. Yeah. I don't know why I did that. There's just no. something that I did, but it's something that's kind of in our culture. And I don't know why it's there. Cause even my mum and dad were okay with that. Like they thought that was an yeah. okay thing to do. Nobody questioned it. Yeah. No one questions it. They're like, Oh, I'm going to lay in bed and ask my brother to give me something, but he's yeah. dead. I why did we do that? Thinking about it. I don't, so, know. I, thinking, <laughs> I don't so know. Weird. You know, the worst thing is like, if I was like, when I was growing up and I was doing something like, kind of naughty or whatever something I wasn't supposed to be doing I used to always have this fear that my grandfather was like watching me <laughs> you know same oh my god that's so weird why does that happen I don't know <laughs> so, <laughs> so how did you go from that to becoming Muslim like what's your story what's your journey right it's a long journey but, but we we have to leave a lot of details out obviously um Long story short, I moved from Ireland over to Spain in 2015 and um, I needed to try and start a new life because the life I was living was just going down the wrong road and um, things were going from bad to worse. And over there, it actually <laughs> it ended up getting worse. Uh, things didn't go to plan, but Allah had another plan and I didn't know that at the time. And um just as I was really like on the verge of giving up everything and losing everything in the process um I ended up meeting who is now my husband um he was actually in Spain too he's originally from South Africa and um, but he was overworking in Spain and he was in a hotel that my family were staying in at the time and they were performing a show there an entertainment show and I happened to go there <laughs> and meet him and he asked to speak to me afterwards and my father was present and everything that he said, he just spoke about himself. And I was like instantly attracted to him. And I don't know why, because I was not looking to be in a relationship at the time. And from that day, we literally were inseparable. And he started to speak to me about Islam and about the Dean. And the more he spoke to me, the more it was like, oh my God, I need to hear this. You know, everything he said to me was just, touching me in the way that I can't even find words to express and um, I'll never forget the day we're sitting in the room and he played the Adan for me on YouTube 
and I literally broke down like I cried like a baby in front of this stranger who I don't know and immediately like I just knew that this is it like this is what I need this is my last hope my last chance I never felt that I needed to turn to God like in a way that I did in that moment like I really felt I was being saved from something that I didn't even know what was about to happen and I literally from that moment just knew okay this is what I have to do obviously when I look back it's kind of like wow you know (laughs) if I step back it's like everything looks so bizarre it happened so fast people probably thought I was absolutely gone insane altogether because (laughs) it just happened so quickly and um so I met him in like October and I remember and it's funny because just thinking about this interview right I was thinking last night and it only clicked to me after six years of being a Muslim he was actually saying my shahada with me every single night before I went to sleep. And I actually learned how to say my shahada over the space of two months, I was saying it before I officially took it. And then I was just thinking, you know, I always celebrate that I took my shahada on the 15th of January, 2016. I was actually saying it from October, November, the year before. So (laughs) I didn't even realize the power, you know, of what I was saying, the meaning, the true meaning that I was actually had already accepted and embraced Islam. It's just, it's phenomenal. So since then, I, I actually, I, he was going to go back home in the January. And um, so we, we knew each other four months and he didn't want to leave me behind. And he just said, look, um, I want to be with you. I want to marry you. But you know, if I'm going to get married to you, I can't marry you as a Christian or whatever. I didn't really have a label on me at that point. So um, I said, well, I've already accepted Islam, technically. You know, I've already embraced it. I've been, I gave up alcohol straight away. There was no question about it. I gave up all the haram things um, that I could at the time. And he flew home on the 14th of January. And then I flew to South Africa the next day by myself and hadn't a clue where I was going, what I was getting myself into. And the same day I landed, I quickly had to go and buy uh, my first abaya, my first hijab, because I didn't know what to do. And I knew I was going to take my shahada as soon as I got there because I wanted to make it official. And um, the sheikh was coming to the house to do it. And he said, look, I'm coming here. Anyways, you guys don't want to be separated. You want to get married. So why not let me marry you now? So I I was literally after flying two long haul flights to South Africa. You can imagine I was so exhausted. I had a seven hour layover by myself. And all I did was read the Quran on my phone because the place was like dead. And I'm arriving here and I'm told, okay, you're going to get married now. And I was just like, what do I do? So I literally sat at his kitchen table. His family rushed over. Some cousins and uncles was around. I had no one there that I knew apart from him. (laughs) I took my shahada and I married him there and then. And that was it. Like, (laughs) that that is it. Isn't it crazy? (laughs) Can you imagine me phoning my mom and be like, oh, by the way, um, I'm married. (laughs) So like, it's like, by the way, I'm Muslim. Oh, and I'm married. <laughs> you can oh, just sure. imagine the shock. Oh, gosh. Awesome. But how does it feel now, six years on, looking back at that? Uh, like, you've been Muslim for six years. How does it feel? Do you feel like it was the best decision you ever made? And then, oh, do you yeah. have doubts? Do you have regrets? Like, how do you feel looking back on that? I cannot regret a thing I've done because you know, Allah plans and he's the best of planners. And if I had have done anything different over the last six years, I wouldn't have become the Muslim that I am today. You know, we're all learning. We're continuously learning. We're continuously striving to kind of better ourselves for the sake of Allah. And um, when I look back, there's a lot of things that I question, like, why did I do that? Or I could have done something differently. Obviously, when you first embrace Islam, there's a lot of... um opinions there's a lot of oh do this and don't do that and oh this is haram and this is makru and 
it would just becomes overwhelming and you kind of get pushed away and you don't want to do it. You know, I was forced, okay, you have to wear the hijab. You have to do this, not by my husband. I'm talking about people around other Muslims, you know, say, but then you step back and you're looking like, okay, but so-and-so is doing something they're not supposed to be doing. And then I started questioning things. And then I started doing my own research and finding out, okay, what is the truth and what is culture? You know, because a lot of the time culture gets mixed up and tradition gets mixed up with the Dean of Islam. And that is what I've been learning at. And only since I came back home, I'm home now, to, um, actually be three years this year. Only since I came back home, I started like a whole other journey because when I first came home, I started dressing immodestly again, um, back wearing gym clothes and stuff like that. Stopped wearing my hijab. Um, even though I was only wearing a kind of part time before, but I completely removed it. I kind of felt that, OK, I have to fit back into where I am now. And, you know, even though people knew I was a Muslim, nobody really sees me walking down the street as a Muslim. So I'm just going to dress how everyone else dressed to fit in. And I was like that for over a year and then lost. Yeah, it's over a year, a year over a year now. I'm stuttering. Sorry. Over a year now, um, I just kind of, I kept making dua and my husband kept making dua and kept asking Allah to grant me that um, hidayah back that I had at the very beginning because it was so, so strong. And Alhamdulillah, I put on my hijab and that was it. And then over like the last year, year or two, I've slowly been starting to dress more modestly to the point where sometimes I do go out with my niqab on, I wear my jilbabs, I wear my abayas. I don't care what anyone has to say. You know, you get to the point in life where you realize no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're wearing, somebody is gonna have something to say. So why not be yourself? You're doing it for Allah. You love yourself for the sake of Allah. You love your modesty for the sake of Allah. What anyone else says, like, it just doesn't matter. And that's the point where I've gotten, like, my Iman um, has gotten so, so strong over the last year. But I had to step away from the culture and from the tr tradition and kind of find myself by myself because it's been lonely. I have no Muslim friends around me. I have no Muslim family around. Come Ramadan and Eid, it's, it's completely different. You know, you miss that. But at the same time, as I said, Allah knows why we're here. You know, he knows that I had to come here to find myself and be an inspiration for others. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Mashallah, you said so many amazing things there, honestly. Um, you touched on some really, <laughs> no, you touched on some really amazing things, Mashallah. Um, but I want to know about your family. Like, how did they react when you became Muslim? What was their reaction? Um, okay, honestly. At that time, because of the way I was living my life and the way my life was going, my mom just thought, oh my goodness, like what is going on? What is she doing now? She's completely lost the plot. She's gone <laughs> crazy altogether. We've lost her, like that's it, she's gone. <laughs> and then when I told her I was moving to the other side of the world, you know, that didn't help anything. Um, after a while, she kind of realized, okay, this is really good. You know, they never thought my husband would be able to handle me. And Alhamdulillah, he's the only one who's been able to keep me calm. <laughs> he's the only one who stood by me when everyone else left, you know, and Allah knows why I needed him as much as he needed me. Um, but my parents, like, they're fine. They were shocked. You know, everything was a shock. My whole life was a shock to them. But Alhamdulillah, they're so happy now. They really are. They're genuinely happy for me. They love my husband like they're like he's their own son. And um, yeah, I couldn't ask for anything more, really. Mashallah, that's amazing. What you were saying about your husband is very similar to how I feel about my husband. And just <laughs> hearing you say it, I was like, yeah, and my husband like is the only one who like stands by me, who's there for me, who gets me. Yeah. It's amazing, honestly. It's really good. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, may Allah give you goodness in this life and the next. I mean, honestly, it's very inspirational. And I'm glad that this is one of the only channels that is going to be showing the story. It's a top secret story. <laughs>
thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Salam alaikum, everyone. Alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah.